welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, Dr. Mark Vorderbruggen takes us foraging for wild edibles and soaks his berries in vodka. We're your hosts, Aaron and Jason. And you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. All right, we're joined today by Dr. Mark Vordenbergen, and uh, I've already apologized in advance that I will butcher his last <laughs> name, but we all just call him Merriweather. Welcome to the show. Hi, and it's actually pronounced Vordenbergen. Thank you, sir. Or if you're up in Minnesota, it's Vordenbergen. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how I talk when I come back from Minnesota, yeah. But do you bring like a basket of lemon bars with you when you when you come back? Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> that's one thing mom knows when I go up to visit that she has to have lemon bars there. It's so awesome you know that. I, I had uh, one of my first bosses in architecture was uh, was from the area, and he would always make all these jokes about lemon bars. And and after a while of looking at him crazy, he was like, you probably want an explanation. And I'm sure, <laughs> I guess. I got nothing better to do. Um, and so he, he let me in on the secret that is lemon bars and then brought me some one day. They're pretty awesome. Yeah. Is this something similar like to the whole like Czech kolachi thing? Kind of, but I don't think people get wound up about lemon bars the way you get wound up about Czech kolaches. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, all right. <laughs> it's just more of that they that lemon bars exist, I think, versus your, anyway, your thing with food and... They, they, they're called a kolbosnik, a kolachi, and it's not a... Coloscopy? No, that feels that feels different. All right. Anyway, so anyway, back to back to Mark. So, Mark, you're here today to talk about landscaping for the zombie apocalypse. Yes. But before we get that, of course, we need to we need to give some background on you. We've we've known you for a few years, although you never do remember us because well, we're not plants. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, that's okay. I totally understand. Um, you know, most people, I they're not Weimariners, so I tend to not remember them. <laughs> but uh, but so now you are actually a chemist. Yes, research chemist for well, what I refer to as big oil. But I'm actually not evil, and no one else in the oil industry is either. I don't want to point that out. <laughs> but, uh, in fact, for the last ooh, going on 17 years now, I've been using my plant knowledge and knowledge of natural products to replace a lot of the traditional, less environmentally friendly chemicals. Uh, used in the oil industry with much nicer, friendlier, greener type stuff. Oh, wow. Oh, that's very cool. So now, is that a cost savings? Is it a PR thing? Or is it just, hey, let's actually be cool human beings, be good shepherds? Ooh, risky question here. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, it is not a cost-saving measure. Mm-hmm. The greener stuff costs more just because the production and harvesting and whatnot is more difficult than, you know, pumping a few things from a big chemical reactor. Mm -hmm. But it's nicer. This is true. This is true. Is this how you got into the wild edibles? No, actually, uh, I grew up in a foraging family. Oh, wow. Yeah, both my parents were children of the Great Depression. And one of the way a lot of the families got through that was just from the wild plants around them. Uh, that knowledge was lost. My mom actually hates the fact that I teach these classes yet because she's really embarrassed by it. It's like waving the we were poor flag. And so I, one of the reasons I stuck with it is because it was still one of our f- sources of food growing up. And then no one earns any money through grad school. So that's another thing. I was nibbling around the yards and, and parks and stuff where I was going to school and just kind of continued on. And suddenly it became the in thing. Oh, yeah. I use your website as my forging foodie dictionary. Every time I'm out, I'm, I'm always referencing back to your website to help me identify whatever is in my yard or I'm running across in a path. And I'm a big foodie, so I was actually ahead of the curve, the whole forging thing and, and using stuff that you can literally get from your front yard um, as actual dinner items. Cool. I, I owe almost all of that to you, by the way. Why, thank you. No problem. It's just if I can throw something out there, the, the foraging has become such a big deal that it's actually starting to be have an impact on environments around a lot of cities and so forth, and, and even up in natural national forests and state parks and so forth. I heard about that with the mushrooms. 
Yeah, and even on a lot of the other tubers and stuff. Uh, one thing I just did today on added to all my plants was a relative abundance scale, like how much of this particular plant can you harvest without impacting the environment? You know, is it plentiful? Is it common? Is it rare? Things like that. Hopefully to help give people a little more information. So if they are going out foraging, they can do it in a much more sustainable manner. That's incredible. As a fellow forager, that's that's a that's a really important piece that is not readily available out there, you know, online. Is guerrilla gardening not in the sense of go plant a random avocado tree, but as far as <laughs> planting, uh, he's laughing because that's something I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> but as far as is there any push for that to start to try to replenish some of the stuff that now that people are getting excited about foraging, uh, this stuff that's having an impact. Not so much in the wild, especially in the national forests, state parks, both of which are places that are actually illegal to harvest plants from. Mm -hmm. So the people that are out there harvesting illegally, they're generally not concerned about replenishing. Mm. They're more concerned about getting it before someone else gets it. Ah, scarcity mentality. I love it. Yep. The tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So that's neat because I'd actually never heard that that story. I mean, that's a very endearing story that that's – and I think there's a lot of – there's a lot of people in the community that have skills like that that have suddenly become very popular mm -hmm. where as a child or something, they were like, yeah, it was this thing we did and I wasn't necessarily proud of it, but now it's like this really cool thing. Yeah, a lot of the whole urban homesteading and all that were skills that people had. 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We were out. Our farm is is a little exposed <laughs> during, at least during the winter, it's exposed. During during the spring and summer, there's a very heavy vine growth that grows over it. And then the trees finally flush back out mm. and the farm is covered up again. The rabbits are very glad for that. Otherwise, it'd be kind of roasted bunny. But it's always funny during the winter since we're in kind of the the downtown warehouse district and now there's all these townhouses that have been built all around it <laughs> mm -hmm. you get all these young yuppie couples walking by with their kids and they're like oh look bunnies what do y'all do with the bunnies and you have to explain well we eat them <laughs> <laughs> and you get this kind of horrified look and sometimes it's a horrified look and sometimes it's a oh tell me more yeah yeah well, it's one of the interesting things about my classes is i get about 50 percent hippies and 50 percent like preppers, survivalists. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the meeting, they're kind of not so friendly with each other. But by the end, they are exchanging rabbit recipes and sources of seeds and so forth. So I'm doing my little part to bring these communities together, I guess. <laughs> you know what? That's funny that you brought that up because I remember that happened to us in our class. We were like the only, only survivalists in there, in the group. And it was like, it was mainly the hippies. Hippies, hippies okay. Hippies. It was mainly the, you know, the hippies. And it was me and Aaron kind of going like, um, okay, so we're just going to go with the crowd, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're all going to think we're nuts. Eat the plants, it's, not the people. That's, right. that's what we were saying. <laughs> Too funny. Yeah. And so now you've said your class has really blown up uh, over the last few years. Yeah. the uh, I'm actually one of the top fundraisers now for the Houston Arboretum with the monthly classes. Oh, wow. wow. That's I bring in more than like what Centerpoint or HEB or any of those big corporations donate. So. Wow. wow, that's really neat. They want me to teach multiple times a month, but <laughs> I'm sure oh, they geez. do. You're their cash what, cow now. Kids, they're kind of going, what about us? And so do you give me money? No. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh, too funny. So now has that fundraising helped do things within the Arboretum? Because honestly, I'm not even really sure what the Arboretum does. It's just kind of a part of the park where there's an office. That's That's all I've ever really been aware of. Actually... It has. In fact, I'm not sure how much I can say, but they finished the design process to really re remodel that whole building and area. And what they're going to build is something pretty fantastic. Oh, very oh, wow. cool. They've okay. gotten enough money now, not just from me, but you know, from many different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, other thing that they're doing is they're wanting to expand into a lot of urban homesteading type classes like beekeeping and soap making and things like that. They're actively looking for people to teach these skills. Really? Oh, wow. And those are 
you know, it's funny that because that was the issue we ran into years ago when we were coming back into it. We couldn't find anything. Like, just like with you, we're finding people to really teach those skills. I know soap making was one that I was trying to find somebody mm-hmm. in the area for forever. Mm-hmm. And then we ran into the issue we couldn't have goats. So I was like, ah, forget <laughs> it. I'll just be stinky after the zombie apocalypse. There's also pl- vegetable oil based soaps. In fact, next week, up at Jesse H. Jones, the park off 1960 up by the uh, Bush International Airport, Mm -hmm. they are having their Homestead Heritage Days where they have a whole bunch of demonstrations on pioneer skills, blacksmithing, soap making, drying meat, black powder rifles, the whole works. And I'll I'll be there all day doing a continuous loop of plant class. Oh, wow. That's neat. I hadn't even heard of that yet. I actually shared it twice on my Facebook page. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And well, you know how much I'm on Facebook. (laughs) Yeah. So well, that's really neat. We'll have to definitely make it out there to to come see that. So it's February eighth, two thousand fourteen, from ten a.m. to four p.m. Very very cool. So that's neat. So now the arboretum is actually trying to going back to that. They're actually trying to bring those classes into the arboretum. Correct. So what does the arboretum do exactly? Their main thing is just a. Wilderness place for people to go and relax, but they also do a lot of educational stuff, mainly nature-based. They have classes on tree identification and rain barrel making. Um, Those are the two. Nature photography, tai chi. Um, They did a jam jelly making class a few years ago. Lots of things. Bird watching, classes on bird identification. It's mainly like a museum of the wilderness. Okay. Think about it that way with assorted educational programs. Okay. They also host birthday parties. They have a, a snake person that will, you know, throw your kid a snake party, and a bug person will throw your kid a bug party, and oh, things that's like cool. that. So, yeah, I mean, I've participated in one of the the chef deals where mm-hmm. they'll have a, a, us at a station along the trail. Oh, yeah, the and tapas we, on the trail. Yes. Yeah, that's a Valentine's Day thing they do. Mm-hmm. You know, the weekend of Valentine's Day. It's coming up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was three years ago, the Houston chef Randy Rucker Mm -hmm. was the guy that did it. Um, I actually introduced the Arboretum to him because he uses a lot of wild edible plants in his cooking. So one of the things he did then that was most of the food stations had some sort of local wild plant and or meat type thing at them. Randy Rucker is, I, I guess, a good Facebook friend. Okay. Um, we go back and forth a lot as far as, you know, chef items. We've been talking about it forever, but to go and forge together, um, and do something chef wise. Hmm. Yeah. I, well, I've been dying to go out and, and actually just go and forage with him. He was my one contact that I had that I knew about foraging before I found y- your stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. In fact, Randy and I, we tried to get, there was a show on discovery or one of those used to be science cable programs where they put a call out. They wanted to have a foragers competition. It was kind of like a cross between Survivor and the colony where they had different teams of foragers go out and they treat them like hell and you still had to collect food and make a good meal and so forth. Oh, wow. But we submitted a demo tape and stuff, but they, they didn't choose us. They're idiots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those reality shows are hit or miss. Yeah, well, I know from experience yeah. it's not exactly... um. It's not exactly yeah, reality. The, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The word we got back from back channels was they were looking for, um, well, less, more hippie-ish type to be on it. Right. Mm. They, they so, were looking for less experienced. Yeah. <laughs> I know that all too well. They want some drama there, so they don't want you to be able to just like walk through it like a cake, you know, a cakewalk. Yeah. You know, they want to see some struggling and, and, you know, starving and some drama and some dramaticism, you know? If you and Randy would have went, that would have just been. <laughs> they would have had been... way too much fun. As well. yeah. <laughs> Speaking of forging, I think there was one of the things that you had brought up while, a while back when we first took your class, and it was about the concept of you're probably not going to just run out into the woods in most instances, and you're not going to find the kind of stuff you find in a grocery store. That stuff has all been manipulated for our consumption. So, can you give us a little more? A little more of a walkthrough as far as the reality of foraging. Sure. Well, it's real easy to find the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and the flavonoids and all those sort of things from wild edible plants. The problem is getting calories. Mm. 
and also to uh, some extent getting protein. Both of them are needed. There's that rule of threes. You die with you know, without three minutes of air, three days without water, or three weeks without food. But people don't realize is after just a few days or a week without food, you're going to be so weak that you're not going to be able to do anything anyway, and it'll be up to someone else to save you. Mm-hmm. So where you find calories from plants is going to be in the seeds, the nuts, and the tubers, basically the the baby plants that have the fuel in it to power the plant until they've reached a big enough size to go into photosynthesis. There's not a lot of those out there at any given time of the year. The Native Americans in the Texas area pretty much were on a constant state of starvation, except when the pecans were ripe. At that point, they would just gorge themselves on every pecan they could find and bloat themselves up and just try and stock up as much body fat to keep them going through the rest of the year when it was very lean. Hmm. So a lot of people... They'll email me saying, I hate society. I'm going to run off in the woods. What one book should I take to help me survive? And it's like, I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. Take that. <laughs> yes. yeah. There's no book that's going to keep you alive, but at least that one's an entertaining read. You read a little bit every day and it'll pretty much take you until you die to finish. Mm-hmm. So to put things in perspective, uh, Samuel Thayer, another really excellent forager who has two really great books out there. Uh, he talks about the calories needed for survival and for in my case, I'm I'm a big guy. I'm 6'5", 200, 230 pounds at this point. I would need 25 squirrels a day to get the calories I need to keep going without losing any weight, without you know, reduced energy levels. If I eat the eyes and the brains and the liver and the guts and stuff, maybe I can get by on 17 or 18. But that's just nasty. Yeah. So it's... People don't realize how easy it is nowadays to get calories because we're mm-hmm. so awash in it, which you can pretty much see whenever you look around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's much, much more difficult to get it out in the woods. That's why in my classes, if there is a plant that is a calorie source, I make a big deal about it. Because that's what you need when it comes right down to it to survive more than the vitamins and minerals, the other things. You know, people can survive a very long time on beer and potato chips years they'll be in crappy health (laughs) but they'll survive Mm -hmm. whereas you just go on carrots and spinach you're not going to last very long yeah yeah those green briars man Mm. (laughs) that was the the one thing that i I remember from our first class is you introduced me to green briar and that was my thing i was like oh we'll just dig up green briar tubers and this and this and this and then I, i started actually doing the math i'm just like Oh, wow, that's going to suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, Mark, you were even telling us that. Yeah, you can make, you know, you can make basically a bread out of it and mm-hmm. stuff like this and a few other things back and forth. You're like, but it's going to take a lot of it to actually sustain you. <laughs> I mean, even just a, a regular baked potato, uh, I'd have to eat 15 a day <laughs> for the calories. Yeah. So that's why meat, there's no primitive culture that survives strictly on plants. They don't have the fat. They don't have the calories. Mm. Yeah, there was some, I don't even remember what I was watching, but they it was something on like the Science Channel or whatever, and they were showing how much grass a human being would have to eat to get the same calories they get out of a couple pounds of, say, lamb. Right. And, and also, the other conversion they were talking about was how the human brain is basically like a computer processor. It requires so much energy <laughs> to power itself that there's just no way we could consume that much vegetation realistically in a day to keep the kind of mental capacities we're used to having up Mm -hmm. and fully functional. Yeah, there was a similar show like that on recently I was watching. It's probably available online somewhere where they did an experiment where they tried to give the people, uh, fed them the, the primitive diet of wild edibles and even some like turnips and stuff. And the amount that they had to eat of it was uncooked. It was you know, they were basically trying to live on just raw, uncooked vegetables and some fruit. Is the their stomachs could not hold enough of the food to give them the requirements they needed. I mean, you, you hear a lot of uh, vegans and so forth with the raw diets and so forth, and and I really I wonder the calorie source unless they're doing a lot of fruit juice or something that's just really high in sugars. But if you're eating just the starches and things like that, it takes a tremendous amount. And if you're trying to get it from grass as cellulose or something like that, there's no way. 
Yeah, I was. Uh, I dated a girl that was on the raw diet, and uh, I don't remember, but she was like constantly eating, and she was like just just super super crazy thin and would run. And then she was like, "I don't understand why I feel so ditzy all the time." I'm like, "Cause you're not eat- you're starving yourself to death, you fool." <laughs> You look good. You you kind of a waif, but you know, I've never known anyone that was healthy that was on a strict like healthy vegetarian diet. Yeah, all of them I've ever known have always been just cake and cookie eaters. She managed to get what? it down somehow at some point, but at uh, at that point, I I didn't really not that I didn't care about her. I just didn't care about her diet enough to ask her how she right. had finally figured out how to balance it. I was guessing she was just gorging herself on like salmon or steak or something once a week. I don't know. <laughs> it's Kitty. She was crazy. I'd like to put a call out if there are any vegan listeners out there. Could you let us know what your daily diet consists of? Because I would actually be interested in knowing. And if you're willing to share your weight. And size that would help too. Yeah, yeah. No, but in, in all <laughs> yeah, seriousness, even, that would be really interesting. I think we'd love to know. But and getting back to it, I think that was a really important point that you just made as far as how many squirrels a day you would eat. Because you hear people, especially people that are like get kind of new into prep or more country, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh, I'll just you know I'll eat squirrels," and while everybody else is trying to eat their own cat or or whatever like that, and you're like, "There's you know there's a lot of squirrels in the city, but they'll go pretty fast considering." how many it takes to power a human being. Mm -hmm. If you read about it in the Great uh, Depression, game pretty much disappeared Mm -hmm. during the Great Depression. Deer were almost impossible to find, raccoon, possums, even armadillos were being eaten. Mm -hmm. Pigeons. Yeah, we wiped out what the the American carrier dove or something like that? The the passenger pigeon, but that was, yeah, but I think that was even before the Great Depression. Oh, was it? Okay. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, who is it? Somebody, maybe it was you and I, Jason, or it may have been John and I, we were talking about, since so many people have lost, by and large, mm-hmm. any real sense of hunting skills, how long it would take for that same effect to happen if we experienced some kind of financial collapse of, of similar proportion uh, and devastation as the Great Depression, like how long that would actually take before people really regained the skills to actually start taking squirrels and... I think a lot of them would starve to death first. But also (laughs) think how many of them are going to be out there after it. Yeah. 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 Houston alone, we got over 4 million people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Memorial Park would be devastated within a week. Yeah. Memorial Park's already kind of devastated after the the drought, isn't it? Yeah. Do they still have the rabbit horde that would come out at night in the uh, park, or is that all gone from coyotes? Probably gone from coyotes. I know there are coyotes at the Houston Arboretum that raid into Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. But then rabbits, there's still probably lots of rabbits around. Yeah, because I guess that just kind of became a dumping ground for people's pet rabbits. Well, one of the problems at the Houston Arboretum is people are dumping their pet red ear slider turtles. So we have lots of turtles there. A couple issues with that. Usually they have some little bit of clinging aquatic plant life that is not native to the area. So every so often we have to scrape through the ponds and take some invasive species out. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because I used to go out there to do uh, a lot of photography, especially like the bullfrogs and stuff like that. I didn't know that went on out there. Yeah. There's a couple of turtles, so some big ones that you can pretty much walk right up to because they're expecting to be fed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right in that pond behind the nature, right the behind the main building there, there's a pond. There's some big turtles there. Oh, uh, wow. Well, that's like when uh, when we were in the Davis Mountains, <laughs> the, the next day after the shenanigans that happened the first night we got there. But the next day, like the park ranger comes over and he's like, good morning, boys. Do not like, like before you said anything else, do not feed the deer. And we're like, oh, like, OK, All right. I didn't realize it was such a problem. Uh, and he's like, no, no, I'm serious. Don't feed the deer. We're like, OK, we got it. Don't feed the." I was, we're like, what is wrong with these deer that that you can't feed them? He seems very upset. Well, we figured it out later in the day, and actually, I was showing you the pictures, Jason, <laughs> and the deer were literally chasing uh, Jonathan around the picnic table as he was, like, eating trail mix or something. <laughs> there was, like, five of them giving Marco the shakedown. <laughs> like, one of them was, like, checking his pockets and had pictures of other ones, like, coming up and sticking their nose in my camera. <laughs> but and, and I can see, uh, see turtles doing that, too. Like, hey, 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 where's... And I know that was actually a problem at U of H, because the squirrels would harass you. 
yeah. on oh, campus. Really? Yeah, because U of H has all those oak trees. Yeah. And they already had a pretty, and people just keep feeding them. You can't sit down anywhere without the squirrels coming over, like, shaking you down. Like, hey, this is me and my friend Vinny. We're here to collect. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got something in your pocket. Give it to me. Give it to me now. They'll they'll take you down. And there's a lot of a lot of little lakes around Houston where if you just stand at the shore, the turtles will come swimming to you because so many people feed them, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the ducks and everything else. I can tell you though from my childhood that red ear slider is edible. <laughs> That's something I learned in China. Also, is every bird is edible. Yes. So. As far as being in a major city and what's available, how much of not landscape in the sense of landscaping, but just in the sense of the vegetation that is around us in general, how much is actually editable? Ooh, if I had to put a number on it, 5% to 10%. Oh, wow. Which is actually quite a bit. Yeah. It's more than I think most there, people would think. A lot of weeds, a number of landscaping plants, they may not constantly have edible parts throughout a plant's life cycle it's if it's edible it's not necessarily always edible or is it different parts of it that are edible can you kind of walk us through that a little bit sure uh, i'll use lantana as an example you know it's a it's a very common landscaping plant it's actually native to the area it has this really wonderful mint like smell most of the plant is deadly toxic hmm. the berries were used by the Native Americans as a survival food. If there's no other food, they would cook the berries, basically mash them up, boil them into a porridge, and eat that. And there'd be some calories and stuff in there. But for the most part, all the rest of the plant is is very toxic. The poke weed or poke salad, that's another one. When it's very young, when it's still just coming out of the ground, maybe six to eight inches tall, it's considered to be an absolute wonderful cooked green but once it gets any bigger and some red starts appearing in the stalk or anywhere else on the plant, it becomes deadly. Even dandelions, they don't become deadly, obviously. But a lot of the bitter greens like dandelions, chicory, sow thistle, crepus, those sort of things, before they go to flower, they're still bitter, but they're palatable. Once they go to flower, in the plant's mind, it's pretty much become pregnant. As soon as the flower appears on these weeds, they they become pollinated. Mm. And at that point, I tell people they go into mama bear pregnant woman mode, and they drastically increase the amount of bitterness, the bitter compounds in their leaves and so forth, because it's just a self-defense mechanism. At that point, they've survived long enough to become pregnant, to begin reproducing, and so they don't want anything to eat them. Before they have the flowers... They'll have, I, I call them sacrificial brothers and sisters, so my brothers hate that term. They know <laughs> a lot of the plants are going to be eaten. So they go, well, okay, you know, my brother there will be eaten so that I will survive. But once they reach that point where they're pregnant, then they, they become much more bitter. So you can still eat them, but it's, it's become somewhat unpleasant. Okay. So there's a lot of things like that. So timing is everything. And also... A lot of the domesticated plants, they've been selectively bred to have a very long period of edibility, whereas the wild plants haven't gone through that. A lot of them, like once you harvest it, you pretty much have to eat most of them. Otherwise, they wilt and go bad pretty quickly because they have not been bred to remain fresh looking and crisp for six weeks while they're transported from wherever to your grocery store. Mm -hmm. I I definitely knew that. I, I remember collecting, I mean, just salad greens. But I was, I started early in the morning and it was for a dinner that night and I wasn't thinking about it. By the time I got to, you know, to start serving it, it was just like, I'm just going to saute this. <laughs> I mean, it was just, just a wilted, just blob of green stuff. Uh, it was just like, oh my God, that breaks down fast. Yeah. Aesthetics don't really come into play if you're a forager. Yeah. I, I've regretfully learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, and I mean, even in our, our grocery store stuff, like normal tomatoes aren't necess- aren't that beautiful, perfect at least the the most flavorful tomatoes are not those perfect red ones that we get in the grocery store. That's more right. of just human beings have a thing about aesthetics. Correct. Mm-hmm. So now, for most purposes, we can really just kind of talk about the general area that the three of us live in. In general, going back to the joking around about landscaping for the, the zombie apocalypse, if somebody wanted to get rid of the silly... AstroTurf that uh, t- that are our lawns these days, and really change it out for something that was productive and was useful, but didn't necessarily look like some kind of overgrown 
weed infested Victorian garden. What kind of options realistically are there for people? All right. Well, one thing, the Eliagnus shrub, this is a common landscaping plant that a lot of home builders here in the, the 90s and 2000s and so forth, when they built the house, they stick a couple of these shrubs in front of the house as part of the landscaping. They're cheap. They are pretty durable. They're interesting looking. They have the top of the leaf is green and speckled with like bronze dots, and the bottom is gray and speckled with bronze dots. Mm-hmm. This time of year, they're starting to be loaded with these little berries. They're kind of football shaped and they're going to be silver or red with speckles on them. Uh, about the size of, I'm looking at my pinky tip, so half an inch long or so forth. These things are loaded with nutrition, the berries. Hmm. They are related to the goji berries, the, the Chinese wolfberry that everyone is raving about, it, having all these wonderful antioxidants and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So, But these bushes, if you look around, if you have these in your, your, in your front yard, go around and look. The berries are actually going to be deep inside, closer to the stem. But if you look underside right now, I know mine are loaded with berries right now. If you go to Foraging Texas or www.foragingtexas.com, you can find it there. In fact, if you sure. click on the landscaping tab, it'll bring all sorts of edible landscaping plants up. Oh, cool. I'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes. Okay. Another one that I really recommend, more so in the backyard or the side of your house rather than the front yard because it's kind of tall, is the canna lily. C-A-N-N-A-L-I-L-Y. Oh, those canna- are edible? Yes. In fact, they were a staple food crop for the natives up in the Seattle area. And then a another similar species was down in Peru. They, If you've ever dug some up, you see they have these big tubers. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, those tubers are higher in starch concentration than potatoes. They're pretty much the highest starch concentration of any plant. Holy crap. Go figure. You can use them pretty much like potatoes. Yeah, uh, my mother, like our whole backyard was basically ringed in those. And yeah. I that's, never knew. Yeah, that's all food. And they don't make good hash browns, but (laughs) otherwise they're very good. Now, why is that? I'm not sure. Oh, no, I just got to go dig some up and fry them up. (laughs) I think there's actually some right outside the studio. Yeah. Yeah. They they form big clumps with, you know, tubers coming off tubers and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they're they're not as easy to store individually as potatoes. You pretty much have to store the whole chunk of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Or you just leave them in the ground till you need them. But that's for those of you who own a gorilla garden in their neighborhood with food from when the zombies come, the kenna lilies are one of my first choices because it is so loaded with starch and you can use it, like I said, as a potato. And so you can make vodka out of it. You can make flour, any of those sort of things. They grow well in any sort of sunny to partial shade. They prefer some moisture, but they can handle you know a fair amount of drought too. And they look nice. They're pretty hardy plants. Yeah, I remember. It's hard to kill them. Yeah, because we had uh, we had them all over our house, and there was an area next to the driveway or something where uh, one of the vehicles got uh, the tank actually got a leak in it, and it ended up dumping like a couple gallons of gas into the area where the canna lilies were, and the damn canna lilies just kept growing. Like oh, you yeah. could smell for years, you could <laughs> smell the gasoline in the ground there, just standing next to it, and the canna lilies were growing like it was no big deal. Yeah, they're a wonderful thing. And another thing, if you let them go to seed at the top where the flowers were later in the summer, you'll start seeing these weird round clusters. If you split that in, it has these fairly large round seeds that are very, very hard. Those were actually used as buckshot. Huh. In you know, earlier days. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and then, the flower is also edible, isn't it? Not really, actually. I've, okay. I'm still trying to figure that one out. It's not toxic but as far as getting anything out of it i haven't really found any reason to eat them like there's extra nutrition or anything like that i've used them as just decoration on a plate sure. before oh yeah now the hibiscus the especially the red hibiscus yes. those are edible and the turk's cap is actually one of my favorite wild ed- well actually landscaping edibles if you will it's both wild and used as landscaping and that's also in the hibiscus family, a.k.a. the uh, mallow family. It's actually, since it's a mallow, it's related to okra. Hmm. Hmm. But the, the flowers are edible, and they have a nice sweet flavor. It's like a honeysuckle. You know, if you mm-hmm. suck the, the nectar out of a honeysuckle, but in this case, if you eat the flower of the Turk's cap, 
it has a sweetness. And what's really interesting to me is twice a day, the sugar content will be higher than any other time during the day, about halfway through the morning. And again, halfway through the afternoon, the sugar content in the Turk's cap flowers will just skyrocket. You can tell when it's at its maximum sugar content because that's when the hummingbirds start showing up. Yeah, I was just about to say that's about the same time that you usually see, or that at least I usually see hummingbirds or, or bees out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in particular, but the on the Turk's cap, the flowers are edible. The young leaves are edible, though I find cooking them improves the texture of the leaves. And then in the late summer and into fall, the little fruit, they look like little red apples, and they actually taste like apples. Those are edible, too. And you can even eat the seeds. The seeds have a, a slight bitterness to them. If you toast them, they're better, or you just spit them out and get more Turk's cap. Turk's cap actually does better in shade. Well, it look, it'll grow anywhere. It'll grow in shade. It'll grow in sun. It'll grow in wet. It'll grow in dry. Um, but if you put it in full sun, it will kind of spread out and get leggy and not as attractive. If you put it in a shaded area, it will grow in a nice upright shrub, and it will get very tall. Hmm. Also, the bark makes a decent cordage. Interesting. Yeah, so that's, a, that's one of my favorite zombie landscaping plants. And mm. Is that fairly common to be able to purchase that at a like a garden center? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to start a Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> you know, I'm putting turkey hey, caps. It's <clears throat> a so quick question for you. The I think it's called liriope. It looks like giant monkey grass. Yeah. The the purple berries that are on that are those edible or not? No. Oh, okay. It's it, it's not no. <laughs> You're right. now the if you let your Saint Augustine go and you get those little seed heads going, those are edible. Okay. And those seeds are in the Saint Augustine seeds. Those are fine, but yeah, not the not the monkey grass stuff. Okay. It's actually related more to a different type of lily than the canna lily, if I remember correctly. So that raises the question. So how do you figure out berries? Give them to your friend and wait 15 minutes? Well, no, <laughs> basically, past history, documentation, and so forth. There may be quite a few berries out there that are edible that we no longer eat. A lot of the Native American food knowledge has been lost. Mm. So they figure maybe 5 to 10% of what the Native Americans actually eat was recorded. Oh, so, wow, wow. And I choose the route of better safe than sorry. I'd rather make sure something someone else has eaten it first. Mm-hmm. Now, where'd you find out about the history of the, the old natives in this area and, and what they were eating? Uh, there's a number of good books on it. And there's also a website put out by the, the state of Texas. It's Texas Beyond History or History of Texas, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they talk a lot about the different Native American foods. But there, there's a number of books on Texas Native Americans. Interesting. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of really cool mu- uh, Native American uh, museums, especially as you get further out west. Correct. Yeah, we went into one when we went to uh, the big cowboy poetry thing in, in the Davis Mountains. Or oh, when cool. we drove down from the mountains to go to it, I should say. Hmm. But yeah, there was a bu- there were several like big Native American museums and stuff that were really cool. And a lot of them had some plant stuff in there. Yeah, I've always found that stuff fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's very neat stuff. I have a huge library of ethnobotanical books and history books and early records and stuff like that. So constantly scanning through them, trying to find some new plants. Uh, are there a number of species that are that you're seeing a big decline in? Hmm. Oh, okay. One that I've noticed is the hop hornbeam or the musselwood, and it was devastated by the trout the the, the drought. Mm-hmm. And it has uh, edible seeds on it. They're actually pretty good. They were, again, one of the staple food sources. Not as plentiful as the pecans. The Each individual seed was quite small, actually. I mean, like the head of a, well, not the head of a pin, but the, you know, little, I'm holding up my fingers here as if you can see that, but really small. <laughs> uh, so you'd have to eat lots and lots of them. But that was one tree in particular I noticed that was just wiped out by the drought. Yeah, it's so sad to drive through Memorial Park now where it used to be this beautiful, lush forest, and now it's... Yeah, they lost 30% of their trees between the droughts and the hurricanes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, you go through and it just looks sad Sad. now. Mm -hmm. Though it has been interesting because I'm starting to see some plants there that I haven't seen back when it was all tree covered. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the best places to look for wild edible plants is at borders, mm-hmm. where field meets woods, where 
woods meets river or water or things like that because it's a very dynamic environment mm-hmm. as opposed to out in an open prairie where it's the same amount of sun pretty much every day or deep in the woods where it's always shady. It's at those where two environments meet, you get you know a lot of plant warfare going on and they're constantly putting things up. So with all this new area opening up in Memorial Park and in the Houston Arboretum and everywhere, really, and, and you got more boundary areas and where there are more boundaries you get a better food Hmm. interesting that's good to know because that's kind of one of the other things i think a lot of people struggle with is where do you look for this stuff right so it's a myth that all the food is in the deep dark woods you go there and you're not going to find a lot Mm -hmm. most of it you're going to find right around in the urban areas where we're churning up the soil or you know new constructions going on a lot of the edible weeds are like the uh, the first plants that show up in a disturbed area mm-hmm. is they're trying to heal the area. And like dandelions, for instance, they have roots that go down 12 feet, and they bring up wow. a lot of the minerals that have been leached down by the rain. A lot of the minerals are water-soluble, so as it rains, they just get the topsoil and the top few feet of the soil gets depleted of these crucial minerals. They get shoved deep down in the soil so the dandelions say bring those back up into their leaves which is one of the reasons they're they're so nutritious and then when they die they drop the leaves there and the minerals get returned right up to the top of the soil plus you have a 12 foot of of organic matter now worked into the soil too Mm -hmm. wow that's pretty fascinating i know like katsu has made started to become an issue in houston yeah and that's actually edible the tips are edible and the it actually produces these very large tuberous growths, kind of like Greenbrier underground. Mm-hmm. In fact, for a while, there was one one of the NASCAR drivers was using ethanol produced from a plant that was fermenting the kudzu. It was their special claim to fame that they were running purely on kudzu power. Oh, that's too funny. I didn't wow. know that. So the tubers are an excellent... Oh, okay, they're an excellent source of starch, but they are also somewhat fibrous, and they require some work to get at. It's one of those things that you basically have to pound and mash and, and soak and things like that. Mm-hmm. But the tubers can be quite large. Okay. That probably also explains why they're becoming so invasive. Yeah. And also makes them fairly drought-resistant. That's why it's all up and down Buffalo Bio so bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah it's Buffalo it's Bio starting to look it. more like a canopy from a jungle now <laughs> right yep and unfortunately that's smothering all the other plants yeah, yeah. just what they needed after a drought mm-hmm. <laughs> now the greenbrier tuber is the same way isn't it it's just completely and utterly fiber yeah it's it's like 70 percent fiber and 30 percent starch and you basically bang it between two rocks for a while to bust it up and soak it in the water and break the little granules of starch off once you have the granules of starch they're very well they're calorie laden and they're a really good thickening agent, better even than cornstarch. So they're wow. used a lot to thicken up the, you know, basically add calories to stews and thicken up the soups into stews, things like that. What are some other plants that are good for, for actually putting around a home's landscape to swap out a landscape for something that's edible? Another good one is pyrocanthia. It's a, a thorny shrub, and that makes a really good barrier plant. And it's actually in the apple family, and the fruit are basically tiny little apples. You can eat them. Oh. You can make the jam, the jelly out of them. They like full sun. They can handle the the Texas full sun. So if you have big picture windows in front of, you know, in a full sun side of the house, plant those there. They have these painful thorns and they break off in the skin and they're very irritant. They have a little chemical in them that makes them very painful. So they work to keep the bad guys out and they give you a food source. Hmm. And then related to that, on the shady part of the house, the bitter orange or the trifoliate orange, it's another sort of really thorny plant. And it prefers, it it turns into a small tree, really. Uh, But you can prune it into a really nasty hedge with lots of sharp spines and things like that. The fruit is not all that tasty, uh, but you can make like a zest from the, the, the peel. But it's a much better barrier plant than a food plant. But barrier plants definitely have their uses. Mm-hmm. Uh, the purple sage, you know, the purple sage of Texas, you can buy that at every garden center in Houston. Mm-hmm. You can make a very nice sage-flavored tea from it. It actually is in the sage family. 
And traditionally, it was believed that the name sage actually comes from a, the belief that it helped improve the, the, your mind. Oh, okay. And, oh, wow. Okay. And, yeah, and that uh, it, like helps the blood flow to the brain and so forth. There, there's some Western science background in that it does, not I believe, increase the blood flow to the brain and do a few other things. It's also considered to be a nervine in that it helps calm you down without making you sleepy. Oh, so, wow. They recommended like sage tea if you are jittery and upset, but just needed to calm down, but not get drowsy. So that's a good one. On the other end of the spectrum, the Yopan Holly. <laughs> it's the only source of caffeine that grows naturally in Texas, and it's actually loaded with caffeine. You don't want to eat the berries. The berries can make you throw up, but the the leaves, you dry them for about two weeks. And then they're good to make tea. The reason you want to dry them for two weeks, and this is the same with just about any plant that you're going to make a tea out of, the plants have what's called a cell wall. It's a hard, rigid, impervious structure. Uh, so if you just drop the unaged plant into hot water, the chemicals inside, the caffeine, the antioxidants, and a lot of those things can't get out. They just stay trapped in there. So when you throw out the, the leaf, you know, strain it from your tea, you're not going to have all the really great compounds in your tea. If you let it age for two weeks, it's kind of like aging meat in that there are enzymes inside the plant, inside the plant cells, that if the plant feels it's dead, and I'm doing the air quotes thing now, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when the plant thinks it's dead, these enzymes kick on, and their job is to start breaking holes in the cell wall so that the plant can decompose. So after about two weeks, the enzymes will have a bunch of holes in the plant wall, and so then when you put it in the water... All those good comp- compounds can can seep out. I recommend after two weeks, uh, actually roasting it or toasting it some. What that does is that it stops the enzymes from continuing. So eventually the thing doesn't rot away. So it's a way of like basically stopping the decomposition of the leaves at that point. And they're, at, after two weeks, they're still going to be crisp and dry. But at that point, you use it just like regular tea. And it has all the caffeine all the antioxidants and all those things. And in my opinion, it tastes better than the, you know, like the Lipton's or a lot of the other teas you buy off the, you know, the grocery store. Now, how cool is that? And I know a lot about the Yupon. Now what's the caveat though, of the one that looks like it? Oh, okay. The Chinese privet. Hmm. It's uh, an invasive species that's taken over the size of the tree, the bark of the tree, the general shape of the leaves and the environment in which it grows um, is, very similar to the yopan holly. The difference is the yopan holly, the leaves and twigs and everything, they're very chaotically, you know, they're pointing every which way. They're they're freaking out, basically. I tell people, think chaos, caffeine, good stuff. That's the yopan holly. <laughs> the Chinese privet, the leaves, they're, they're arranged in what's called a, a linear opposite uh, arrangement. They're all lined up down the length of the, the twig, the, the, the stem. And it's it's very uniform looking. The berries in the fall and winter are dark and form in clusters that look like almost like tiny grapes. Whereas the the Yupon holly, it has the clusters of red berries right up against the stem. But also the leaf of the Yupon holly, if you look closely at the edge, it'll have kind of what we call dentata or teeth. Uh, they'll have rounded little bumps along the edge. Whereas the Chinese privet leaf will be smooth around the edge. The Chinese privet, it's not going to kill you. It might make you a little upset, but it does not have any caffeine or anything like that in it. And you can buy the Yopan Holly at all the nurseries, or you can just walk pretty much anywhere there are you know, some trees, <laughs> and there's going to be plenty there. Yeah, it's, so, it's, pretty, yeah. it's a pretty common uh, under, understory, understory mm-hmm. um, plant, isn't it, here in Texas? Yes, yeah. yeah. What's like the most common plant that people walk past just about any day and don't even think about the fact that it's edible? Dollar weed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the stuff we most people spend <laughs> lots of money trying to kill out of their lawn. Yeah, yeah. It, it amuses the heck out of me. If you drive around Houston, you'll see the big signs, dollar weed, we'll get rid of it for you. You know, they'll come in and spray it with all these chemicals and so forth. <laughs> it's actually quite edible. Mm-hmm. It's kind of has a texture of cabbage. I find a big one can be the size of a silver dollar. If you get it when it's dime to nickel size, it's actually very tender, hmm. and you can just use it as a salad green. 
You use it kind of as a cabbage. You can make the the col or well, you could probably make coleslaw. I haven't tried making coleslaw out of it, but the sauerkraut and kimchi and things like that you can make out of it. Oh wow! Huh. No, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, how big of an industry is there just trying to kill dollar weed when it's yeah perfectly yeah. good? All the, almost all the weeds that we think of in our lawns. Yeah, salad uh, greens. Yeah, just about. Watch out for the buttercups, though. Those are toxic. Ah, okay. Are they okay? I didn't know yeah. that. So now, is somebody like you that didn't grow up with someone to really, somebody to really take them by the hand and teach them about wild edibles, how do people go about learning about how they can forage, what's edible, what's not edible? Okay, so you're asking me to put myself out of work, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course not, because it's much easier to find an amazing mentor yeah. like you to go learn from, but... Exactly. Yeah. And, and, I, and this is something I cover in all my classes. The way to do it, the way to learn wild edible plants is you sit down and start identifying the plants around you and then go to Google, do uh, just a Google search, name of the plant plus the word edible. Uh, ideally, you want to figure out the the scientific name of it. And there's all sorts of really good resources for helping you uh, identify the plants around you. There's online, there's a number, like uh, a lot of the pesticide, herbicide companies they have on their websites guides to identifying weeds of your yard so they can tell you which of their pesticides is needed to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite books is the uh, Martin Press Little Golden Guide to Weeds. It's a $5 book. It's, it's small, but it covers all the common urban and country weeds that you're going to to find and it shows pictures of the flower and the leaf and the seed and gives a scientific name and where it's likely to be found and all this. So it's very handy for identifying what's, you know, on your land. Another really good book, and I'm probably going to screw up the title, but it's basically the uh, trees, shrubs, and vines of the Texas Hill Country. And actually most of the trees, shrubs, and vines that it shows are found, at least from... West Texas, well, pretty much anywhere it's not desert. So all across East Texas, North Texas, the Gulf Coast area, up through the hill country. Uh, it's just when you start getting out to West Texas, uh, some of those plants aren't available. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on my website, foragingtexas.com, I have a link where it's called the Annotated Guide to the Trees, Shrubs, and Vines of the Texas Hill Country. And in, in that post, I list... Every plant in the book, it's page number, and if it's edible, medicinal, or toxic. So, oh, wow. Yeah, and your website is, I, I know Jason's on it constantly, and uh, and I visit fairly frequently. Your website is a huge resource for people. Can you give us the address again? Sure. It's, it's www.foragingtexas.com. You've actually put a couple of plants recently up. Uh, one was the, is, I think it's a wild cucumber. That you found uh, like in downtown or something? Yeah, the creeping cucumber. Yeah, that fascinated me because I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, they're actually, it's a, I won't say invasive. Once they show up, they pretty much are there for forever. They are a, more of a summer type plant. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the little the little cucumbers, they, they're, again, I'm looking at my thumb. They're about the, the size of the first part of my thumb. And they taste just like cucumbers. They're very tasty. It's often one of the favorite things that the people get to eat when they take the class in the Arboretum at the summer. If you let them turn purple and fully mature, then they become a very, very, very potent uh, expelling agent. <laughs> <laughs> they will give you diarrhea like you've never had before. And it's like colonoscopy level diarrhea wow but when i get them when they're still green they when they're when they kind of look like the a watermelon like a little tiny watermelon hanging from a vine that's when they're absolutely perfect man that, that when i first saw those i was, i thought that was so cool because i'd never seen anything like that and the, the other one was the buffalo gourd ah and that's more of a west texas hill country sort of thing mm -hmm. and its other name is the stinking gourd or fetid gourd it smells horrid <laughs> And the uh, it's real easy to really to find because once you start like if you're out with someone and you start realizing man your friend stinks, <laughs> more likely you're 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 entering the the fetid gorge or, or buffalo gourd zone. The gourds themselves they'll start showing up in midsummer and keep going on into hard frost. They're about the size of a baseball, and again the skin will kind of look like the watermelon, kind of the striped uh, green and white. 
with the stripes running from this the where it connects to the stem down to the opposite side. The seeds are edible, but you need to make sure you get all the flesh of the melon off because otherwise they are so intensely bitter that they will induce vomiting. Hmm. I don't know if you remember as a kid, but maybe I don't know how old you are, so maybe I'm dating myself, but the Mr. Yuck stickers and oh, yeah. the company came up with this stuff called Bitrex that it's added now to a lot of the windshield wiper fluid and things that look like they might be drinkable, but aren't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's like that level of just absolute foulness. But the seeds were considered a very good source of energy. They're, they're seeds, they're protein, there's calories, there's oils in them. The other interesting thing is the root. It forms this giant tap root. And the Native Americans considered to be very powerful medicine. The taproot it will actually grow in kind of a, a human form, and that'll have kind of arms and legs, and it could be either male or female, depending on what other appendage shows up. <laughs> the belief was if you had like a broken arm or you know some body part, some particular body part was injured or hurting or some something wrong with that body part, you would make a tea from the corresponding part of that tuber and or that the tap root really and drink it and that would help and then also just as a, a normal longevity type inducing tea they would drink it for that reason so it's like a native american ginseng almost yeah actually exactly wow and um, one other interesting thing though that it was believed that uh only the most powerful of the shaman shaman mm-hmm. I say that word i apologize we're allowed to dig it up, and you have to be very careful when digging it up, because if you nicked it or damaged the root, some evil thing would befall you or your family in the location that you nicked the root. Huh, huh. But uh, the couple of early botanists recorded that, whereas the Native Americans wouldn't dig it up except for the, the shaman, they had no problem if a, if a white man dug it up, they'd take the, they would happily take the root. And they just figured, you know, either white men was dumb and, you know, let them suffer the damage. Or... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> hey, here's my next question. Pawpaws. You got yes. me on a pawpaw kick that I cannot even start to describe about. And I still to this day have not been able to find one and eat it. They are rare in this area. You got to go more on the Texas-Louisiana uh, border. Mm-hmm. A number of places are starting to sell the pawpaw trees if you want to plant them on your property. In fact, the Houston Arboretum, they have their native plant sale several times a year, and they sell pawpaws. They are worth getting. Uh, you need more than one. They are not self-fertile. Ah, okay. So two or three is is the better number. And they, they like shade. They prefer some you know partial to full shade, mm. things like that. They don't like the full sun. They're more of an understory you know, kind of in the woods sort of plant. Right. You actually introduced us to, it's the miniature version, a dwarf pawpaw or something? There were a couple actually in the arboretum. Yeah, there's. A, it's not a dwarf one. It's The trees themselves don't get very big. That Maybe that's what you're thinking there. Okay. Uh, side note, also important for the zombie apocalypse, the seed of the pawpaw, it has some very potent lice-killing uh, compounds in that. In fact, a number of the lice shampoos and so forth actually use pawpaw seed extract as the lice-killing ingredient. That is wild. You are just so much knowledge, man. So much knowledge. I really sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Research it. Yeah. Now, um, I guess give a little plug to to the medicinal guys. Uh, You had a big um, show down there in Victoria, and regretfully, I had to miss it. Okay. Um, Actually, I want to point out that was the it was Sam Kaufman from the Human Path. It was his show. Gotcha, mm-hmm. gotcha. I was just there, and we just kind of turned it into a eighty percent him, twenty percent me sort of thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> And actually, he he does a podcast too, and he interviewed me last week. It's up this week on on his site. Oh, oh cool! Wow. I'll have to go track down a link and make sure that's in the show notes too. A lot of his stuff is fascinating. Yes, uh, I've been yeah. trying to make some time somewhere in my schedule um, to get out to one of, of his seminars or uh, get togethers. Yeah. He, he's, a, he's one of my heroes as far as all this stuff goes, his knowledge of med- medicinal plants and so forth is seemingly unlimited. Uh, that was the first time I actually got to attend one of his classes and it really helped. Uh, this might sound egotistical. Uh, it helped 
confirm some thoughts I've been having about the whole medicinal plant thing. A lot of people just poo-poo them, but there's there's actually a lot going on. And a lot of people make the mistake. I'm I'm paraphrasing Sam Kaufman now on this, and that they make the mistake of just thinking you use medicinal plants just as okay, you have a fever, you take this one. You have you know, basically like off the shelf medicine. Mm. There's more to it to get them to work right. You you have to understand uh more about the symptoms and it sounds complicated. It's a little complicated, but once you start getting into it, it's the whole Zen thing. First there, what is it? First there's a mountain, then there's no mountain, then there's a mountain again. So I think I, I'm, I'm foolishly at the point where there is no mountain. <laughs> as I, as I deep, deeper into it, I'm going to realize again that, wow, what I thought I knew, I don't. Gotcha. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. I've make, I have elderberry growing in my property, so I have an elderberry extract. I make a dandelion saw, uh, ointment things like that. I got actually, I'm looking at a jar of Hawthorne berries that I got soaking in vodka right now. Side note to Aaron, um, that tree over there, over the chicken coop, mm -hmm. that is a, Hawth a Hawthorne berry tree, sir. Is it? Okay. Yes, that's what the, the, the tree little, that everybody's little, been arguing about for five years, what it is. I, no, I still don't know what that thing is. Uh, the other one with the little red berries, which one are you talking where the one right over the chicken coop? Oh, I've never paid attention to that one. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the one that I that I'm thinking that we were. It was china berries, then it was soap berries, and yeah. No, I, actually, I do think you are correct. That is a soap berry, or okay. Soap, soap tree, soap tree, soap yeah. berry. I I don't know. But Mark would know better than we would. Yes, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why we're arguing with each other. We've got him here. They're very different trees. Send me a picture. Gotcha. We'll do. We'll do. Hawthorne tree. That's a really good tree to have. See, because it has some really amazing medicinal properties. Yeah, now the the little berries, there's not a lot of flesh on it. Are they red? Uh, well, now they're starting to get kind of dark now. No. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, when they were ripe. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out what it was, and I was like, "Oh, this is that thing that um, you know Meriwether was talking about." Oh, okay. <laughs> in the in the spring, if it's Covered with clusters of white flowers mm -hmm. that smell kind of bad, That's and the leaves kind of look like parsley. That would be a parsley hawthorn. There's, I believe, over a hundred different types of hawthorns. Oh wow! But the the parsley hawthorn is fairly commonly used in landscaping, and it's fairly common in the Houston area. Just wild too. Okay. Um, but all the hawthorns, uh, the flowers, and the even the leaves and the berries, they have compounds that have been shown to improve the heart muscle and strengthen the heart and they also have an interesting effect i was uh, discovered this actually on the lance armstrong live strong website reading about uh, hawthorns and then confirmed it scientifically in other journals and so forth but the the hawthorn plant it has compounds that act as beta blockers Mm. Most people that are on high blood pressure medication, like propranolol and so forth, and I'd like to point out this is not medical advice, but the the propranolol and those they they work as a beta blocker, and uh, basically the betas are beta block beta waves in the brain control the involuntary muscles, and so they they help the heart not squeeze so hard, so they they lower the blood pressure. The other interesting thing about beta blockers is. They also suppress the fight or flight or fight reflex. I mean, they don't make it completely go away, but they tone it down quite a bit. Huh. Um, going back to the high blood pressure medication like propranolol, uh, that's the most common one. A lot of concert musicians and live play actors, things like that, that actually suffer from stage fright, they will go and get a prescription for propranolol or some of the other beta blockers because it helps suppress that fight or flight reflex and all the company involuntary effects, the tunnel vision, the dry mouth, the shakes, the upset stomach, all that. Huh. And so, you know, it's just something in the zone in the zombie apocalypse. If you want to kind of quench your fear some and be able to deal with things that might be a plant to have on hand. Yeah. No kidding. Make a big tea of that in that, in the sage. There you go. <laughs> very relaxed, very, very it, calm. I'll ready be very to go. Thin. There you go. Headshots. <laughs> <laughs> so again this is not medical advice but <laughs> i want to go to jail <laughs> right, right so now how long have you and uh stephen kaufman known uh, stephen am i mixing i'm mixing <laughs> yeah. up kaufman's that we know sorry actually the 
we knew of each other and we had referenced each other apparently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was our first live meeting. Oh, okay. It's at the, the Victoria thing. And you know, we've been in contact since then. Mm-hmm. Quite a bit. And like I said, I, he interviewed me last week for his podcast. So yeah, I, yeah, I put the are. link up on my Facebook page. So okay. we scroll down a little. Yeah, we'll go grab it. That's really neat. Yeah, we've been, Jason and I both keep trying to make it out to uh to his school in in austin the only it's every time i look at his calendar it's at a completely inappropriate time of the year for me to do anything (laughs) it's like all right i gotta be in california that time of the year or i gotta be in las vegas that time of the year it's always when i've got something going on but it's it's worth making the time for yeah going back to um your books do you have one that talks about mushrooms mushrooms that we can find around here all right i i want to point out i do not have a book out first but again going on the amazon my amazon store the forger shack there is a section on mushrooms uh and there's there's actually a, a pretty good book uh recently re-released called the mushrooms of texas or texas mushrooms or something like that oh wow by a seltzer and seltzer and that one's really good it doesn't cover 100 percent of the mushrooms but it covers a good you know 75 or 80 of the common mushrooms you'll find Downside of that uh, particular book is that it has the same problem a lot of plant books have for identification. It has just one or two pictures of the mushroom and then a whole lot of text. Got it. I really like using it in conjunction with, uh, in particular, the Smithsonian Guide, I believe it is, uh, Guide to Mushrooms. And what I like about the Smithsonian Guide is that it shows the top of the mushroom, the bottom of the mushroom, the side of the mushroom. It cuts the mushroom in half so you can see what it looks like in half. So it, oh, wow. it is designed to truly identify the mushroom. Got it. And so that's really important with mushrooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then there's also the Falcon field guide to mushrooms. And that has what's called a key guide in it to, you know, you work through, does the mushroom have this feature or that feature? If it has that feature, turn to this page. Okay. And this page, it says, okay, does it have this feature or that feature? And you, you work your way through but with the the mushrooms, it's it's kind of complicated. You need to have some patience. Mm-hmm. But I also recommend that one. Like those three books together will get you identifying the mushrooms. Got it. Yeah, you had one recently post up on on your Facebook page. I think it was a, a, a lion's head, a lion's mane. mane yeah, that's it. That thing was uh, that it that just reignited my fascination with mushrooms and mushroom hunting. Obviously, there's the the age old issue of identifying them and and how complicated that can be. Are dealing with mushrooms a as dangerous as everybody makes them out to be, and b are they nutritionally worth the effort of fooling with them? Okay, to answer your question, are they as dangerous? If you misidentify it, yes, it can be fatal. However, the one thing, generally, the the rule: stay away from little brown mushrooms. <laughs> it's just just in general because the the different there are some little brown mushrooms that are edible, and there are a whole bunch that are really toxic, mm. and the differences are very subtle. Um, there are quite a few. Uh, I've started posting them on Foraging Texas, like the turkey tail. That it's a polypore. There are no toxic polypores. There are some that are relatively inedible because they're tough or whatever. But most of them have very strong medicinal properties. And that's where the mushrooms come. What makes mushrooms worth harvesting is they have some really astounding uh, antiviral and antibacterial and anti-tumor and all sorts of really potent medicinal properties. The The key there is to focus. Uh, I'm too, it's, it's kind of a circular logic thing. Figure out. Like with the the Texas mushroom book, go through it and see which ones it lists as edible and learn how to identify those. Go on Google and type in the name along with the word mimic and see if there's anything toxic or toxic mimic and see what comes up. Uh, okay. It's like that. Like the lion's mane, it's a very distinct, you know, shaggy mushroom. There are no toxic mimics, anything like that. That one will eventually appear on my website. I have like 30 or 40 plants. I'm looking at my list of things I still need to add to my <laughs> website. Yeah, I'm kind of a completist that way. <laughs> What's so, probably one of the more common in our area? Mushroom mushrooms? Water. Turkey tail. Turkey tail. Turkey tail. And that one, it has very strong medicinal properties, and it makes a really good tea. It tastes like mushroom gravy. 
Oh, wow. You just boil it and it looks, it's a small, flat mushroom that grows on dead wood. It's a very potent, it breaks, its purpose is to break down dead wood, break down the cellulose and the lignin. It looks like the tail of a turkey. It, it's fan shaped and it has bands of, of white and blue. Well, maybe not so much blue. Some have blue, but white and brown and green. And if you've ever looked at the, you know, the sty- striations in a turkey tail, it looks like that. If you go to my website again, it'll tell you all the features you need to look for uh, to identify that you truly have the turkey tail. But there's really no toxic mimics. And it's just about year round and it makes a really good tea. And it also, you can do uh, medicinal extracts. You soak it in Everclear for a while first and then take it out and soak it in water for a while and then combine the two to get both the the alcohol soluble and the water soluble components of it. And actually, the the structure of the mushrooms is a poly sugar, or basically a bunch of sugars linked together in a polymer form. So there are some calories involved into it too. Hmm. The side note: what's really interesting is mushrooms are not plants; they're actually closer to animals from a taxil. Uh, like when you look at the the family tree of everything of life on Earth, the split occurred after the split between animals and plants, basically. Wow. Uh, oh, that's wow. neat. I yeah. never and knew that. Actually, they excrete enzymes that dissolve the wood and so forth and then take it back in. You know, Basically, they're like stomachs inside out. Huh. Right. And the other really good thing to know about them is in national forests and national grasslands, like the Sam Houston National Forest, the Angelina National Forest, you can legally harvest mushrooms. Mm-hmm. You are allowed. The, the forest rangers can't say a thing. You're limited to just enough for your own personal consumption. You cannot harvest them to sell them. Mm. But you can go through and take what you're after. But again, that's only in the national forests and national grasslands. Okay. Your next class is February 8th, right? At the... at the Yeah, at the Jesse H. Jones. And that's a free one, actually. I'll just huh. there is a... To help out the Jesse H. Jones Nature Center. And then... February 22nd at the Houston Arboretum, and then March 1st at Jesse H. Jones, March 8th up at Blooming Grove outside Dallas, and then I also speak at a lot of Master Naturalists and Master Gardeners clubs. Uh, I got some library. I'll be talking at some libraries, Barbara Bush Library, sometime. (laughs) I need to to check my calendar here again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I... Essentially, this time of year, and it's nice out, and people are suddenly thinking wild edible plants for some reason. <laughs> Let's go eat the landscape, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Come, come July, things die down a little because mm. it's just too hot. <laughs> this is yeah, Houston. wimps. <laughs> yeah, I think we took your glass in like June or something. Yeah, it was pretty it, it was pretty warm. <laughs> pretty warm. We just gotta get used to it. Yeah, now, there's no AC in the zombie apocalypse, right? <laughs> That's true. Now, Mark, you actually sell harvesting tools too don't you well not exactly what i have is i have an amazon based store called Mm -hmm. the forager shack and you can get a link there from the foraging texas it's on the right hand side directly below classes the next tab is sponsors and on that i have a couple of different sections Uh, the first is just foraging books and videos there are a lot of really well there's hundreds of different books about foraging wild edible plants most of them suck (laughs) yes and so on there i have just the ones that i think are worth having and then the same with medicinal plants and herbology i have a section on the books that don't suck and some of the gear that i recommend and then i also have a section on Basically, preparedness, self-sufficiency, uh, different books, and also some gear, things like that, things that I personally use. Like, I have solar panels sitting in my bedroom windows that I run my computers off and things. I'm actually deep into the prepper lifestyle. Yeah, because that was one of the other places that, that Mark and I first met was uh, through the Hoodlums, which was uh, the late, great Ron Hood's mm-hmm. uh, group. Yeah, regretfully, I never got a chance to go to one of those. Yeah, yeah, it was neat stuff. Ron was a neat guy. They're actually planning the the spring gathering of the Texas Hoodlums right now. They're looking sometime in April. Oh, really? Where at? Most likely, it'll be this private campground called Sulphur Springs Camp in Bend, Texas. And it's beautiful there. 
the nice thing about private campgrounds is we can sit around and pull out big knives and stuff like that and <laughs> no one can say a word to us. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. We'll have to check that out too. Yeah, I think that because I haven't been since uh, the last Texas hoodlums that uh, Ron himself was at. Yeah, things kind of died down quite a bit when Ron passed away. Oh, but I'm sure. People are trying to get him back. Mm hmm. Hmm. Or not him back. <laughs> well, yeah, scary. <laughs> but get the, 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 the Texas hoodlums gatherings back up and going. Oh, it's very cool. I'm still. glad to hear that. Yeah, I think His wife took over. Yeah, and I think the the other thing was that the the spring one was usually right around Mother's Day or something. Yeah, and that always that that always made it really tough to make it to those. Yeah. Well, Mark, I sure appreciate you coming on today and helping us uh, relandscape our yards for the zombie apocalypse. My pleasure. And uh, always good to catch up. Hopefully I'll see you again, at least at the uh, the next Hoodlums. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can make it out to one of the Jesse Jones events, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll definitely. I know Jason's already looking at me like he's going to drag me to those and make me yep, leave, much. leave work to go do that. Pretty much. Yep, uh, yep. That'll be awesome. <laughs> I'll probably have to just hog tie him and just carry him out. But... <laughs> hey, that works. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I know it's getting, getting late. And uh, like I said, Mark, I sure appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. With that, we wrap up episode 111. Thank you for joining us today. And, as always, from the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound.